السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم It's a great honor for me and for Sheikh Muhammad Haidara Al-Jilani to be here with you. And we don't come here to teach, we come here to learn. And we want to learn from you and from your generations of experience in this land. And we regard you to be one of the most important of all Muslim communities, especially in the West, in the English-speaking world. So we're here really to learn from you, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. I've been asked to speak about Surat al-Kahf. I understand that this is what you've been doing for this month. And I'll share with you some reflections. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as all of you know, advised us to read this beautiful surah on Friday. And it has in it blessings of protection from one Friday to another. He also advised us, as I'm sure everyone knows, <clears throat> that in the first 10 verses of this surah, and in the last 10 verses of this surah, there is protection from the tribulation of the grave and from the tribulation of the Dajjal, of the Antichrist. And one of the things that we learn in studying about the signs of the end of time, which includes also the belief in the Antichrist and his appearance, is that God has created an order of good and he has also created an order of evil. And that order of evil reaches its highest or lowest manifestation in the Antichrist, in the Dajjal. And many of the tribulations of our time that we live in, they are tribulations that pertain to that order, the order of evil. And one of the things that we will see in this beautiful surah is that it is, of course, a surah with many different parables in it. There is the parable of the garden, and I understand that that's probably what you were thinking you would speak about today because you've spoken about the other things. The parable of the garden is very beautiful, and it's connected with the theme that runs through the surah of the fact that God has made this world an adornment, but that adornment will all end, and that we must get the love of this world out of our hearts, and we must be grateful for whatever we're given, and we um, must believe in God and be worthy of Him. And in this process, we have the story of the garden. This story has different commentaries. One of them is that the two men are actually brothers. <clears throat> and that one of them received, they both received a huge inheritance from their wealthy father. That one of them used that inheritance to build two gardens, beautiful gardens gardens of grapes, and here in Cape Town you have some of the best grapes. So gardens of grapes, and then around them were date palms, and then in them were rivulets or rivers that flowed, and the garden never oppressed them. That's the word Allah used, that it never tathlim, it never did oppression. It always gave and gave and gave again. The other brother, though, he received an equally great inheritance, but he gave it in charity. And so therefore he became a poor man from a worldly perspective. So here also you have the theme that is common in the surah, and that is the theme of um, the integrity of the common people the integrity of the poor, 
Uh, the owner of the garden, this is, of course, a parable. Uh, it means It's a true story, but it's a story that is told in order for us to reflect on it and to benefit from it. But that parable of the garden is a parable that the Meccan oligarchy, the wealthy Meccans who opposed the Prophet وسلم, they would have immediately applied to themselves. And this is something that is good for you to remember also. Because the garden that is described, or the gardens that are described, they are like the gardens they had also. And they were extremely wealthy people also. In Mecca there were the poor, and there were the oppressed, and there were those who were deprived. But the upper classes that opposed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were very wealthy. They controlled the caravan trade. So therefore, it's also speaking to them through the story of one who was before them, who was like them, and of course, whose gardens were destroyed because of the fact that he didn't give thanks for them and he was arrogant. But also you see here, that the man of the two gardens, he believed in his intrinsic merit. He believed that even if God did resurrect me, he would give me better than this because I am so good. Who are my fathers? Who are my mothers? I am such an important person. This was again the mentality of those who opposed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they believed that they had intrinsic merit. Again, because of their genealogy, because of their lineage, uh, because of the nobility in deed and practice of their forefathers. And so this is also one of the beliefs that Allah is correcting in this surah and elsewhere that you were created from clay. And of course, we have here in this surah the story of Adam again and of the angels being commanded to prostrate themselves to him who was created from clay. And of course, they did that, but Iblis didn't. And Iblis, his school in that was, of course, very similar to the school of the Meccan oligarchy, that I have intrinsic merit. No, you don't have intrinsic merit. I have intrinsic merit. You created me from smokeless fire, and you created him from clay. So he has no right to my prostrating myself to him. That's the school of Iblis, the school of Anna, the school of me, myself, and I, of the ego. So this is also corrected there. And ironically, we also know that although none of us claims intrinsic merit, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, no matter how great your forefathers and mothers may have been, it's all a matter of your sincerity. It's a matter of your actions. And Allah emphasizes this point throughout this surah. But we also know that ironically, this human being who is created from clay, and has in him the lowest of the low, also has in him the highest and the high. And therefore, if we were to talk about intrinsic merit, then actually Adam is the one who has it and not you, Iblis. Because he, in the completeness of his creation, is the one who can attain the highest of the heights. And so can his children, you. And so can, can his sons and daughters. So this is a very beautiful surah. And you have this parable. And then this parable, it is really in many ways the theme of the surah. The theme of not being deceived by the ornamentation of this world. The theme of purification of the heart and of humility. The theme also of accepting all of the believers. <clears throat> God tells the prophet, make yourself patient 
with those who call upon their Lord in the morning and the evening. And of course, those of the believers who were in Mecca. But most of those believers, as you know, were poor people. Many of them were slaves or former slaves. They were people of the lower economic and the social classes. And the oligarchy of Quraysh, who had these gardens and this wealth, they didn't want to sit with them because they felt that was below their status, that we are better than them. We deserve to be lifted up and we should sit in a special place and we shouldn't have to mix with these commoners. So these are all messages that Allah gives us Azzawajal, in this beautiful surah. God tells us about the ornamentation of this world and he tells us that all that ornamentation is here so that he can test them, the human beings, test us. Which of us is the best in actions? And of course, if you think about the or ornamentation of this world, you think about beautiful mosques like this, beautiful homes like the homes you live in, a beautiful country like this country that you're blessed to be in, in the great con continent of Africa, this continent of such immense potential and such great people. God bless it and protect it and enable it to develop in the best of ways, and you should be leaders in that. You think about the beauty of this land, the fruits and vegetables and foods of this land, gold and silver, clothing, horses and cattle and sheep and farms. That's all ornamentation of the life of this world. But there's one ornament that's even greater than that. And what is that? You, yourself. You are the ornamentation of this world. The children of Adam, <clears throat> they are the greatest thing that God created. And of course we find ornamentation in our spouses and in our children and others. But you are the greatest ornamentation of this world. And therefore you must make that ornament an ornament that is real, bi ta'ala, by being what you are capable of being, by coming to this high status that we as the children of Adam have been allotted. May we be that. May we be, you've been lights here. They call this the city of the awliya because of the fact that many of your forefathers were great scholars and mujahidun in Nusantara, the islands of Indonesia and Malaysia, and the Philippines and so forth, and the Dutch would take them and bring them here because they were too dangerous there. And these were great awliya. These are your forefathers. So you have that blessing, and you're also said to be the city, the Umm al qura of South Africa. Uh, may you also tap into that tradition and realize that tradition in the best of ways and understand this age we live in. We have to be able to understand our tradition, which is extremely rich, but also we have to be able to understand this life that we, will, we live in today, and I know that that is one of your main goals. So in this surah, <clears throat> you have a number of themes, but we have three main narratives. And we'll say that there are three main narratives because they are each related to each other. And these, as you know, are the story of the sleepers of the cave. And Christian hagiography, that is the Christian study of saints. We have hagiography. We write about our saints. You talk about your saints here, the awliya that were here. But Christian hagiography actually begins with these sleepers. So Christians all knew about them. They didn't necessarily know the details. Were they three? Were they five? Were they seven? Uh, but they all knew about them, and they knew that this was one of the first miracles of the true followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. So you have that story, the sleepers of the cave. 
And then we have after that the story of Moses and the mysterious teacher. And in the Hadith tradition, we're told that he is Khidr. He is Al-Khidr or Khidr. He's of course not mentioned by his name in the Quran. And he is an ambiguous figure in the sense that we don't know if he was a prophet or a saint. And <clears throat> if you look at the history of the ulama, you'll see that some say he was a messenger and some say he was a prophet. That's actually most of them say that. And some say, no, he was a wali. But his status is ambiguous because even if he were a prophet, he is hidden and prophets are not usually hidden. Prophets have to teach the message and warn the people and he doesn't do that. He's known by the people and he's loved by the people. And of course, he has the secret of greening. They say that wherever Al-Khidr would stand or pray, it would become green. And of course, Moses and Joshua, they know that they've come to where he is because their fish comes alive. And they say the fish was salted. It was dead for a long time. It was a salted fish and they'd already eaten from it. And yet, because they're in the presence of Al-Khidr, the fish comes back to life and it finds itself its way to the sea. So you have the story then of Moses and of his teacher, Al-Khidr. They meet, of course, at Majma al-Bahrain, the conjuncture of the two seas. And of course, here in South Africa, you are at the conjuncture of the Atlantic and of the Indian Ocean. I'm told it's a little bit further to the east, but it is here, the conjuncture. And of course, in Moses and Al-Khidr, you have the conjunction of two other seas, don't you? The outward sea of Sharia knowledge embodied in Moses, and then you have the inward sea of Haqqa'iq that is embodied in Al-Khidr. And these two seas come together, and they don't join they mix a little bit, but they stay separate. And of course, in this story of Moses and of Khidr, you also have the Shaykh Murid Sunnah. And this is a Sunnah of the Prophet and of all the Prophets. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't need anyone. He was the greatest of all human beings. He didn't need to have Gabriel. He didn't have to go to the cave to purify himself in worship, but he does those things for our benefit. He does those things to establish sunnas. So here you have this special relationship between the outer sea, which is Moses, and between the inner sea, which is Al-Khidr. And this is also part of our tradition. Imam Abu Hanifa, he reached a height in Islamic law that perhaps no one has ever attained. Imam al-Shafi'i, God be pleased with him, he said, al-fiqhu iyalun ala Abi Hanifa, that fiqh is the dependent child of Abu Hanifa. Uh, in the Maliki school, the Malikis owe so much to Imam Abu Hanifa, we couldn't even begin to talk about it. I've actually written about it. Um, but Abu Hanifa, when he attained this great height, in the outer law, he had to go to a teacher of, inter of internal guidance. And who was that? Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. And Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq was in Medina, and he had the same beliefs as Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. But he becomes the Shaykh of Abu Hanifa, just like Moses has a Shaykh who is Khidr. And Abu Hanifa says that if it were not for two special years of my life, the Halak al Nu'man, that al Nu'man, which is his name, Abu Hanifa is his kunya, he said he would have been destroyed. Imam Malik is the same. Imam Malik, he had as his shaykh Imam Muhammad al Baqir, the father of Imam Ja'far al Sadiq and Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. Again, these are Imams who believe what Ahlul Sunnah believe. 
but they gave him the inner light. Imam al-Shafi'i, God be pleased with him, who is a master of the outward law with a very special methodology, master of the Arabic language. Who was his sheikh? It was actually a she, Sayyid al-Nafisa. She was his sheikh and also Shayban al-Ra'i, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Shayban al-Ra'i and Ma'roof al-Karhi. And then here also in this story you have another Shaykh murid relationship, which is what? That between Moses and Joshua. Because Joshua is the feta. He is the noble youth that is with Moses. And then, of course, we have the third story, which is the story of the righteous king. And this is how most commentators refer to Dhul Qarnayn, that he was a righteous king of ancient, ancient times. Most commentators will say he's Alexander the Great. I would say that Alexander the Great is an archetype or a reflection of that archetype. Very similar, but not actually the same exactly. Some people will even say that Cyrus the Great, who was the first emperor of Persia about 200 years before Alexander the Great, that he is Dhul Qarnayn. Cyrus is much closer actually than Alexander, but Probably, this is my belief, Dhul Qarnayn is much more before that. And we have other indications of that as well. So you have these three stories. And these three stories have in them common elements. That's why we can say that they sort of link together. And that other stories like the parable of the garden, you know, these are like woven. These three stories are woven in the midst of those. But among the things that we see is that in all three stories, you have the example of people <clears throat> leaving their home and journeying, journeying, traveling, which is also a metaphor for leaving the dunya. Of course, they do it for their particular reasons. And in the case of the sleepers in the cave, then they are actually facing a Dajjalic figure. They are living in the time of an emperor. We are said that we are told that his name was Decius. Decius, who was a well-known Roman emperor and one of the biggest persecutors of the Christians who ever was. That's a true story. He was a powerful man and he required you to sacrifice to his statue. So he had his statue in all the cities and you had to sacrifice to that statue and in a way you had to worship it, bow to it. And of course the seven sleepers is, we're not going to do that. We won't do that. We believe in God. So all of them then are journeying. All of them are leaving their homes. All of them in that process are doing other things. Another thing that we see here too is intermediate states of being, which we can call barazikh. The barzakh is the intermediate state. So you have that in each of these stories. In, in the case, for example, of the sleepers, they go into a sleep that lasts for 309 years. And this is a stage between life and death. In fact, if you had seen them, as the Qur'an tells us, you would have thought they were awake. So even in their sleep, they don't look like sleepers. So they're in this intermediate state. And in this, God also um, you know, seeks to establish the truth of the resurrection. Allah says in the surah, um, وَكَذَٰلِكَ أَعْثَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ وَعَدَ اللَّهِ حَقُّ وَأَنَّ السَّاعَةَ لا ريب فيها إذ يتنازعون بينهم أمرهم. So God says, and in this way, we cause them to be discovered after 309 years <clears throat> that they might know that God's promise is true. The promise here being what? The promise of the resurrection. And that there is no doubt about the hour. Uh, since they were disputing among themselves about their affair, about this business. 
That can also be read when they were disputing. That's a different recitation. But so then you have also um, these barzakhs. Of course, Moses and Khidr, they meet at the barzakh, the Majma' al-Bahrain, this intermediate area between the, the two seas. And um, you have this also in the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Um, we ask God, and then also you have another topic that comes here in these three stories, and that is the miraculous. And this is something that we have to believe in. We believe in the natural order. We believe it is a sunnah that God has established, but it doesn't dictate terms. God can break that natural order and he can substitute for it whatever he wills, as he wills. In fact, even when Allah begins to tell the story of the companions of the cave, he says, do you think they are marvelous? And what he means by that is that there's something even more marvelous than this miracle, and that is the natural order. Look around you at the mountains, look around you at the trees, look around you at the fruits, look around you at yourself. In this natural order that you are part of, there are marvels which are much greater than these marvels that break the natural order. So you have here the miraculous, and of course we have to believe in that. One of the fundamental beliefs of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is the belief in mu'jizat the belief in miracles, which are exceptions to the rule. They break the order, and they show us that God has power over that order. He can say to the fire, be cool and be safe for Abraham, and it will be that way. You must believe in that. These are not metaphors. These are realities, and these are the things that make our iman alive, especially in this time, because this is the time when materialist philosophy, which denies all of these realities, is coming at you from every single direction. And so therefore you have to root yourself deeply in this faith. So there is the miraculous. And then another thing that we see here, the miraculous sleep of the sleepers, um, the miraculous things that happen with Moses and his teacher, the fish coming to life, for example, and the other things, uh, the miraculous nature of Dhul Qarnayn, the righteous king who goes to the west and the east and then he goes to that intermediate place in the middle, that these miracles are not the miracles of prophets, except perhaps in the case of Al-Khidr. And that's, as we said, because his status is ambiguous. No Muslim can say that he was a prophet or that he was a saint. We're not allowed to do that because the creedal beliefs that we hold must be certain beyond any doubt. And with Al-Khidr, we don't know for sure. He might have been a messenger. He might have been a prophet. And most say that he probably was. He might have been a saint. He was one of those three. But so here also in this surah, especially in the first parable. And in the third, you have the non-prophetic miracles, which we also must believe in. This is also part of our belief as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You have to believe in the non-prophetic miracles, which we call in Arabic, karamat. And so this is also a story that establishes, establishes karamat al-awliya the non-prophetic miracles of, um, the, of the believers. Um, just to finish, um, since the time is almost over, uh, we want to get on to the khutbah and the prayer, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. I would just like to make one point, and that is that one of the amazing things about this surah <clears throat> is the fact that God says here that we had them discovered, and in this way we caused them, the sleepers, to be discovered that they might know, that is, that the people might know that God's promise is true. And here you have an amazing reference to history, and that is that the early Christians 
were divided on a number of points. The first thing that they divided on was the crucifixion. Did you know that? The first thing the Christians disagreed on was the crucifixion. Saint Jerome says, the blood of the crucified man had not dried in the earth of Judea, which is Al-Quds, Jerusalem, but that there were those who said, it's not him, it's one who looks like him. That was a very common belief among Christians in the first and the second centuries. Very common. So they disagreed on that. But another thing is that you had among the early Christians those whose worldview was that of the children of Israel. And that worldview is very similar, if not identical, to your own. So they had a prophetic worldview. And then you had another type of Christian who are very much taken in by the Greek Hellenic point of view. And that point of view was based on a dualism, a radical dualism between spirit and matter. And the belief in Jesus Christ as Savior, as divine Savior, that comes out of this group, the ones who are the dualists. In fact, Arius of Alexandria, who is one of the defenders of the humanity of Christ, his opponent, whose name was Athanasius in Alexandria, in Egypt, he would say, if Christ were not completely God, he couldn't be a savior. Does that make sense to you? Probably not. It didn't make sense to me either. Because we believe in ethical, moral salvation. You've got to believe. You've got to do good. God will forgive you. He will take you to the garden. But they didn't believe in that. They believed in a transcendent God who had nothing to do with the world. We don't believe in that. We don't believe that God is in us or outside of us. We don't believe that God is touching us or not touching us. We don't believe that God is transcendent outside of the world or that he is imminent inside the world. All of those are mistaken beliefs. God is not like anything that you know. He doesn't have an analogy, nor does the throne of God, nor does the pedestal. They belong to a world where there's no right or left. There's no up or down. You don't know that world, and you can't talk about it analogically. But these Christians believe that God was transcendent. He has nothing to do with the world. And you have a little bit of God in you. And you need to have a Savior <clears throat> who is divine, who can take that little bit of God out of you and take it up to him. And that's your salvation. Okay, we don't believe like that. But the thing is, is that these Christians who would come to dominate the Christian discourse and radically change it, they also had issues with the resurrection because they believed the body is dark and evil and deprived, and this world is too. It's dank, it's death, it's sinfulness. So I go back to the body that they couldn't believe. And so therefore the seven sleepers, as you know, <coughs> probably we shouldn't say seven sleepers because we don't know for sure. <coughs> but the sleepers, they show that the resurrection of the body is real. And in this regard then they are renewing and reestablishing the message of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Again, our belief is that Jesus wasn't crucified. And you're not alone in that. You share that belief with many early Christians. It would be lost later on. So that today, if you say that, Christians think you're crazy. You never read the Gospels. They're different Gospels. And if you look at the Apocrypha, the Acts of the Apostles in the Apocrypha, every one of them 
says Christ wasn't crucified. Every one of them but one, which are the Apocrypha of Paul. But the thing about that is that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Messiah. The Messiah is a conqueror. The Messiah is a powerful person. T.S. Eliot says, Christ the tiger. The Messiah is not crucified. The Messiah is not defeated. And therefore, our story, which is the true story, establishes that he was indeed the Messiah. And therefore, God lifted him up, up the ascension so that he come back a second time, which will be, will be in the time of the Antichrist and will be in the time of the Mahdi, alayhi salam. We ask God to bless you, you beautiful people. You have struggled. Your people have struggled. The African people have struggled. Uh, may God bring you all together. May he make you a source of peace and goodness and of guidance, and may you draw on all this rich past that you have. We're so happy, we're so honored to be with you in your beautiful land. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.